Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another one of our conversations with Marty Ross, MD. Um, I see that we've got a number of people here tonight, a number of new people, actually. Um, to those of you that have been here before, welcome back. And to those of you that are new to these webinars, um, the way that these work, you get to write the questions. So you get to create the content of this webinar with what you want to know. And uh, the way to write questions to me um, is to write at the bottom of your screen in the chat box. I do request that when you create your question, please only hit the enter button one time. Um, if you do create, if you do hit enter while you're trying to write your question, that's going to create multiple questions and it becomes very difficult for me to follow uh, the stream of those questions from my end and even to be able to post them for people to see. So I do request that you only do one question at a time. Um, We'll handle as many questions as we can tonight. Often that means I'm only able to do one question per person. So if you do happen to try to post two questions, I'm probably going to hold off on answering that second question until I get a chance to go through the rest of the questions first. Okay. Um, so you may see some um, black shadows hopping around behind me there. Um, my two dogs come with me to, the, to work into these webinars. So you may see uh, Halo and Thor uh, popping around behind there. and. Um, <laughs> I may even hold up one of them later on in the webinar, too. Um, throughout the webinar tonight, I may do some sharing of information on our Lyme disease site, uh, the Treat Lyme and Associated Diseases, and specifically um, the information part of that, which is called the Treat Lyme Book, um, so that you know additional places that you can look for resources. And finally, uh, tomorrow morning, um, I will send out email notification that the recording for tonight's webinar is ready. So yes. Um, there is going to be a, a recording of the webinar tonight, and that's being um, handled right now. Uh, it's actually occurring as we're talking here, okay? So with no further ado, let me see if we got any questions here. Looks like we got a number of them already. And about, the, about my ability to respond, just so you know, I will handle them to the best of my ability, but there are occasionally things in line that even I get stumped by, uh, even after uh, managing this illness for the last uh, decade or more that I've been doing it. So. Um, I'll give you my best shot at anything that you might pose to me tonight, okay? So with no further ado, let me go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm going to post your questions on the screen so that you can see them. Uh, tomorrow when you look at the recording, though, the recorded version does not show the, the questions that I post on the screen. The ability to see those questions is really only for those that participate in the live webinars, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Hello, Aaron. Let's see. I have many symptoms of Lyme or co-infections, fatigue, migratory pain in the joints, an autoimmune disorder of an unspecified nature, to name a few. I live in Rhode Island and spend a great deal of time out hiking. I have had Igenix testing done. My multiplex uh, B. burgdorferi was negative for... Uh, let me see if I can find the rest of your question here. Unfortunately, Aaron, it looks like your question has been divided into a few, which again makes it complicated for me. Everyone, when you write questions, also try to keep them brief. This uh, works better for brief questions. So let me try to find Aaron your next part of your question here. Uh, the testing for the uh, Bieberdorferi was negative for both whole blood and serum. My IFA was equivocal with a score of 40. My IgM was 31 negative, indeterminate, 41 indeterminate. My IgG was 41 plus plus. I'm wondering what my next step should be because although the overall test results were negative, I still feel horrible most of the time. And there's a last part to your question there, Aaron. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, terrible. Most of the time, I am unsure as to how to proceed. Could you please advise? Thank you for your time. Okay. Aaron, bear with me just a minute. I want to go back and look at the first part of your question. You're going to repost that. Okay. So everyone, Aaron has a lot of symptoms that suggest Lyme, but testing that's completely negative. And I just want to comment about the nature of the testing that she had done. So she talks about having something done called a multiplex. What a multiplex is is a DNA test to see if the DNA of the Lyme germ is actually in the blood. 
Now, Lyme does not readily live in our bloodstream, and so therefore it is um, hard to find it uh, with genetic testing, if you will. And um, so it's not uncommon. In fact, 30% of the time that somebody has Lyme, it will show up with this multiplex DNA test being positive. So it, the multiplex will only find it 30% of the time. In terms of the Igenix um, Western blot testing that you had done, Igenix Western blot testing will find Lyme roughly 80 to 85% of the time when it's present, which means it will miss it 15 to 20% of the time, okay? Believe it or not, though, the Western blot testing is still the best test that we have. Now, when somebody has Lyme, it is possible to get a Lyme disease diagnosis even when the testing is negative. And ultimately, Lyme disease is always a clinical diagnosis, okay? We make it based upon clinical standards. And so the four things that I consider making a Lyme disease diagnosis are, number one, what's the risk of getting Okay, so the highest risk of getting Lyme is if you have a known tick bite in the Northeast. Uh, I, I, you don't write anything down here about having a, a known tick bite, but also just doing outdoor activities in the Northeast, such as Rhode Island, uh, puts you at great risk. 50% uh, of the time that people have Lyme, they do not remember tick bite. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is um, that there are a type of ticks called nymphs, they're baby ticks. They're about the size of a poppy seed, and you may not even be aware that you've been bit by one, okay? So you have risk where you are. Second thing we look at is your symptoms, and I don't know all your symptoms because we're not able to list those all out, but if you have a lot of Lyme symptoms, and you've got the symptoms suggesting it. Third thing we look at is, are there any physical exam findings? And most often, there aren't physical exam findings. And then the fourth thing that we look at is, do you have supportive testing? And at this point, you don't. However, if you have significant enough symptoms and you have high risk of getting Lyme and there is nothing else to explain your disorder, the one thing you might want to try is to do a three-week antibiotic challenge and then redraw the Western blot test, okay? So your Western blot test uh, were kind of indeterminate. They weren't solidly negative. There was still some activity on your Western blot. What happens with the Western blot, the immune system will make antibodies that are detected on the Western blot only if it can see the germ. And Lyme does not like living in the blood. I already told you that. So the immune system does best creating antibodies against things it can see in the blood. So what we can do, and where Lyme likes to live then is out of the blood flow and in tissues that have poor oxygenation, which means it lives on your muscle coverings on your tendons, in your tendons, inside your joints, okay? Places where the immune system can't see it and get at it, okay? So what we can do is kill Lyme germs. And we kill Lyme germs by putting you on antibiotics that will kill the germ. And the tissues don't like to hold onto dead bug parts. And so they basically release those Lyme proteins um, into the bloodstream where now you can have a stronger reaction to, uh, to uh, the germ, okay? and you might get a positive Western blot. The antibiotics you might consider using are Biaxin, 500 milligrams, one pill twice a day for three days, um, or you can consider doing a doxycycline, 100 milligrams, two pills, two times a day, again, for three weeks, okay? Now, there is a whole article that gives you a lot more information than what I just did about how to diagnose Lyme, and I'm gonna do a screen share so I can show that to you. All right, so let me see here. Okay, so here we are. Um, I'm in the treat line book right now. Actually, we're looking at the table of contents for the treat line book, okay? And um, I'm gonna go ahead and look within the table of contents. We're gonna look at the chapter called How to Diagnose. And I'm gonna take a look at the articles in here. And one of the articles is this article called How to Diagnose Chronic Lyme Disease More Than a Test, okay? Take a look at this article. It's actually the most of it is a video article um, that I created for a whole webinar that was devoted about uh, Lyme disease issues, of which I boiled it down to 15 minutes. So this is a pretty extensive uh, video about the ins and outs of diagnosing Lyme and what to do if testing is negative. Okay, so you'll find much more information in this video. Again, this is part of the Treat Lyme book. So for those of you that have not subscribed, 
If you try to look at this article and you haven't subscribed, you're going to be asked um, to subscribe, okay? Um, so um, anyhow, that's the article, and feel free to take a look at it in, with more depth um, um, uh, tomorrow or maybe later on tonight, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and go back here again. All right, so there we are. Aaron, I hope that answers your question, and good luck with that. All right, so let me get rid of Aaron's parts to Aaron's question here. Okay, now let's see here. Let's see, hi Kelly. Um, let's see, hi Dr. Marty. Any helpful advice for chronic Lyme patients who are traveling for periods of time away from home? Also, if you have time, do you take both the thymic protein A and the olive leaf extract at the first sign of flu? Thanks so much, Kelly. All right. Hmm. All right, so let me start with the second part of that question. So what Kelly is responding to is there is an article that we have, um, that I have made free here for about the next week within the treat line book about the steps you can take whenever you get a virus during this cold flu and virus season that we're in okay and in general you should know i do not recommend flu vaccines because what we see in people that have Lyme is when they get the flu vaccine um, Lyme seems to get more active and i think um, the other thing about the flu vaccine is generally it only works about 30 to 40 percent of the time if you go back and look at studies that are done uh, in the season uh, immediately following flu season, we find that usually the flu vaccine really is quite poor in, um, at its ability to help people. And there's actually greater risk, therefore, of harm from getting the flu vaccine than benefits. So in general, I do not recommend flu vaccines, okay? So what do you do uh, about virus infections when you have Lyme? Well, there's some things you do that really shorten the course of the virus infection once you once you start getting those symptoms. So at the first sign you're getting a scratchy throat, or at the first sign that you're getting nasal congestion, or you're getting nausea in your stomach, um, the one thing I would do is to take a substance called thymic protein A. So thymic protein A is sold as a product called ProBoost. Um, it's part of my uh, cold flu first aid package, if you will. Um, it comes as a powder, and you would want to put one packet under your tongue every two hours during the first day. And then on the second day, you would take one packet about every eight hours, and that would conclude the two days. So you use your ProBoost for two days. Now, what thymic protein A does is it rapidly turns on the cells that fight viruses to turn on to attack that virus, okay? And it can dramatically shorten the period of time that you have symptoms and may even make it so you really don't get um, sick at all, all right? The second thing you can do is to also take with that olive leaf extract. Olive leaf extract is an herb that can actually boost the immune system through different mechanisms. It also kills viruses and can kill bacteria as well too. And usually I'll take it as a 500 milligram pill three times a day. So Kelly, those are the things I would do. And with the flu, absolutely, I would do the olive leaf extract. If you don't think it's the flu that you're getting, you probably could get by just doing the ProBoost, thymic uh, protein A by itself, okay? Now everyone, here in a minute, I'm going to show you more about um, that article so you can know where to read it later and also where you can find what I just recommended as well, too. But it's what I call the cold flu cold flu season first aid package. It's what I use myself to shorten the duration of anything to keep it from mounting up. It's what I recommend to family and friends, and I definitely find it beneficial for people that um, have uh, chronic Lyme disease as well too, all right? Now, what about traveling? Um, it's hard to say. Um, so, you know, it's the same kind of things that when you're at home. So you want to try to avoid um, um, having gluten. You don't want to change your eating too much, right? So you want to avoid your simple sugars and your gluten. Gluten's inflammatory. Simple sugars may make it easy to get um, yeast. Um, you want to stay on your antibiotics. You want to stay on your supplements. 
Um, um, sometimes if your antibiotics are knocking you down, if you want to be able to come up and do a little bit better while you're on your trip, if your antibiotics are primarily targeting Lyme, it is okay to stop your antibiotics before you travel. Uh, Lyme replicates about every four weeks to um, every eight months, therefore it's slow growing. So if you happen to stop those things that are working to treat it, the germ will just not suddenly come back and get active, okay? So it's okay to periodically stop your um, Lyme antibiotics, all right? And I sometimes will stop people even two weeks to four weeks periodically. On the other hand, if the antibiotics that you're using are um, directed at treating Bartonella or Babesia, you do not want to stop those for periods of time because you'll go back to ground zero in terms of the number of months that you have to devote to treating those infections, okay? And beyond that, Kelly, I'm not sure what specific advice you're looking for for travel, all right? So um, um, I hope that answers things well enough for you, all right? I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share here, everyone, so that we can look at the recommendations that I have about what to do uh, for cold and flu. And uh, bear with me just a minute. I need to do something real quick. I'm just going to go silent here for a minute. Okay, so I'm back here again. Let's go ahead and find that cold flu article for you. Um, all right, so going back to the table of contents, and I think we're going to look at the how to, I think it may be in the infection treatment plans chapter. Yep, there it is. Keep this cold and flu package on hand for fast results, okay? And in this article, I talk about the thymic protein A, talk about olive leaf extract. We also talk in here about possibly using mushrooms, reishi gano mushrooms. Um, if you happen to be a person that keeps getting every virus that comes along, reishi gano mushrooms uh, you can use to boost the antiviral part of your immune system on a chronic basis, on an ongoing basis. And this does a good job of stopping you from getting repeat viral infections as well too. You would do that as one to two pills three times a day, okay? Now, where can you get these? Well, you can find these at the supplement store um, that we have, and that's uh, called uh, Marty Ross MD Terrabrook ND Supplements. There, uh, through that link that I just clicked, we have a whole page that is devoted just to those antiviral things that we have, okay? So your olive leaf extract, your ProBoost, thymic protein A, and then the reishi gano mushrooms are here, okay? Now, the other thing you can do is just, if you want to find them, just look at these products individually. Um, our store is right here. This is the Marty Ross MD Terrabrook MD Supplements. Um, I know I mentioned a number of supplements in the articles that I have in the Treat Line book, and you'll hear me mention a number of them tonight. Um, you've got to be careful about supplements that you're using those products that have uh, been uh, manufacturers that are known to select high quality ingredients that have a greater chance of working and also that do not include artificial fillers that could hurt you in Lyme disease. So we picked what we consider to be those products that are safe and most effective, and we've put them here in the Marty Ross MD Terrabrook MD Supplement Store. This is where you find the same supplements that we use with our patients here at the Healing Arts Partnership. And in addition, these are the products I would recommend. If you, we write about them generically in the Treat Lyme book, but you can find them here. So for instance, if you see we recommend curcumin, you would just type curcumin here in uh, the search bar and go ahead and click, and you're going to see the various products we have for curcumin, which is this Mariva 500 is our favorite one here. Okay. All right. Let me go back here again. Okay. So um, I know that's rather long-winded there, Kelly. But I did want to show everyone what you were referring to, which is probably from the email that I sent out earlier this week, letting people know what they can do for cold and flu. And for those of you that didn't get the email, that's the article that you can take a look at. It is part of the Treat Line book, but for this week, I've made it as a free article that anyone can read, regardless of whether you have a subscription to the book or not. Okay? All right. Thanks, Kelly. Good luck to you. Hello, Brenda, and you're welcome in advance. Um, let's see. Thanks again for your help. I am taking amoxicillin and probenicid and biaxin for BART in neurologic Lyme. 
I am having burning sensations on my skin and arthritic pain comes and goes. What can I do to combat the arthritic pain, burning, and, and heal? Okay, so burning pain typically means neurologic injury or nerve in, uh, inflammation, okay? And so there are some uh, both prescription and herbal medications you can use for that. And then in terms of the arthritic pain, um, there primarily are herbs that I would suggest for that, okay? So when you have a Lyme infection in you, the reason that you feel badly is that the immune system overproduces a group of chemicals called cytokines. And for those of you that are familiar with my webinars and my writings, you know I talk about cytokines often. And in some ways, what I would rather describe Lyme disease as is a syndrome of cytokine excess. So let me talk about cytokines here real quickly. So cytokines are good and bad. On the good side, when a white blood cell sees a Lyme germ or a flu virus or a strep uh, germ that gives you strep throat, um, it responds by making cytokines. And those cytokines um, are good because they help create more white blood cells to fight the infection. They draw those white blood cells to where the infection is, and they help those white blood cells work better. That's all great. The problem in Lyme, though, is that the immune system does a rotten job generally of getting rid of Lyme. And because of that, it tries harder and harder, and eventually it makes too many cytokines. Well, too many cytokines make it so you can't think. They disturb your sleep centers of the brain. They make you fatigued. They make you hurt. They interfere with how your hormone systems work. Um, basically, I could go through what we call Lyme disease symptoms, that list, you know, you've seen as, you know, way long. That list of Lyme disease symptoms, predominantly, um, those symptoms are symptoms of cytokine excess, okay? So when you have Lyme disease symptoms, it's not really true you have Lyme disease symptoms. What you really have are symptoms of cytokine excess. And it's those cytokines that can make your nerves hurt. It's those cytokines that can give you that arthritic pain, okay? So you want to lower cytokines. And so the thing that will lower the inflammatory part of both of that um, would be to use curcumin. Uh, curcumin is my favorite anti-inflammatory for these kind of situations. Uh, prescription medicines, we really don't have good anti-cytokine agents. It's the curcumin that tends to work best here. So it's curcumin, which is a component of the Ayurvedic or uh, East Indian seasoning uh, turmeric. That's what gives Indian food its yellow coloring. And um, you would do it as a 500 milligram pill, one pill three times a day. Okay, we have that in our store as a product called Mariva 500, all right? You want to make sure if you do curcumin, it is a liposomal variety. That means it's been microscopically wrapped in fat to help increase its absorption, okay? So that's really important that it is microscopically uh, wrapped in fat, okay? All right, second thing is, is to help nerve pain, you want, you can work either prescriptively with anti-seizure medicines or anti-depression medicines that can help decrease the neurologic transmission of pain. Or you could work herbally with an herb that helps increase a chemical in your brain called GABA. All right, so GABA, our brain is full of GABA receptors. If we give more GABA to a GABA receptor, it can calm agitation, it can calm neuro neurologic pain, all right? So that herb that you can use is something called L-theanine which is an amino acid-like compound that comes from green tea. It is not caffeine. <laughs> it is a separate compound that comes from green tea. And in the brain, um, it is turned into the chemical GABA. It also, in addition to being turned into the chemical GABA, seems to have an effect of just calming the electrical pulses of the nerve separate, separate from that GABA effect, okay? So if you're going to use it for pain, you can take it all the way up to 1,200 milligrams in a day. You don't want to go over 1,200 milligrams. And it comes as a 100 milligram pill. Usually I have people take 100 milligrams um, uh, anywhere from one to three pills at a time. And if you need to get over more than just taking 300 milligrams all at once, you can start dividing it up throughout the day and you can work up to um, three to 400 milligrams um, three times a day, okay? If you take it at night, it can help with sleep, so you can make that one of the times of the day you dose. You don't want to go over 1,200 milligrams, though, okay? So it's L-theanine, that's L-theanine, T-H-E-A-N-I-N-E, okay? So that's what you would do for nerve pain. 
right? If you were to do prescriptions for your nerve pain, um, probably what I would work with first off would be something called gabapentin. That's a prescription. It's an anti-seizure medicine. It is a GABA analog, okay? So it's like GABA. It's a synthetic version of GABA. Um, and that's GABA pen. Um, part of the problem though with GABA pen, there's been some science coming out lately that shows that over time, over time of using long-term usage, it may uh, impair thinking um, and maybe um, hurts the ability for nerves to work right in the brain. So it's got me rethinking using it on a regular basis, but that would be on a temporary basis while you wait to get your Lyme under control and get out of this period that you're in of excess cytokines, that might be something you could use on a short-term basis. It's a 300 milligram pill and you can take anywhere from one to four at bedtime is usually what a, how I will use that, okay? So I wanna do a quick screen share here because for nerve pain um, and what to do about your neurologic symptoms, I just wanna show everyone in case you're having, if you are one of those people that also has issues regarding the nerves, the things that you might do for that, okay? So I'm gonna go back to the treat line book here, and look at the table of contents, and there's a whole chapter we have on brain and nerves, okay? And in this, there is an article called Neuropath Repair, Heal That Tingling, Numbness, and Pain. And you might wanna take a look back down here later, I've got a whole um, video on that, and we talk about repairing the injury with something called glutathione that you may want to take a look at here. Um, also talk about um, uh, the steps you can take to decrease the nerve inflammation, which is that curcumin here. And actually, I didn't, I didn't put the l in here. I'm going to have to add the l part into this article, okay? But anyhow, those are some steps that you can take as well, too. All right. So let me go back here. All right, uh, Brenda, thank you for that question, and I hope that gives you some things to think about, okay? All right, actually, let me show you one more thing here. This will be really quick. I hope it'll be really quick. Okay, so back in the our Lyme disease supplement site, you can also look at this supplements tab up here, I'm moving my cursor over it, and you can look at how we use uh, the supplements we recommend by medical problems. Okay, so there's the section on brain and nerves here. And in here you'll find, there's your L-theanine, for instance, okay. Um, and there's your Mariva 500. So we have both of those supplements that you can find here on this page, all right? All right, let me go back here. Okay, so um, thank you for that question, Brendan. Good luck to you. Hello, Nina. Let's see. Do you think mold issues can contribute to someone with Lyme not getting better? Thank you. Absolutely, I do think mold issues can contribute to that, okay? So there's, um, at the beginning of treatment, I always try to take a history, or as part of the history I take, always wanting to make sure there isn't something else mimicking what a Lyme disease can look like, okay? So I, I'm interested in knowing, are there other conditions that can trigger cytokine excess. I mean, you all heard me tonight. I said that Lyme triggers a cytokine excess syndrome. So we want to look to see, are there other illnesses that, that might you might have that can trigger cytokine excess, all right? So if many of you are familiar with my Lyme disease treatment guidelines called the successful treatment recipe, and you know that one of the steps we recommend in there is that you screen for yeast at the beginning of your treatment. You screen to see if you have too many yeast living in your intestines. And if you do, that can be a source of increased cytokines. You need to knock those down, okay? But the other thing that can trigger cytokines is having mold toxicity issues, all right? So by mold toxicity issues, I primarily mean three different toxins that get made by molds. The, that is trichocythein, which is a black mold toxin. There's another toxin called aflatoxin and a third toxin called okratoxin, okay? Now those toxins tend to be made by another mold that can be found in wet buildings called, um, or another type of mold called in wet buildings called aspergillus, okay? And then the okra toxin is something also that can come from food sources as can the aflatoxin as well too. All right, now what happens with these toxins is there are about 25 to 30% of people 
that have um, genetic programming errors, if you will, um, where their um, immune systems um, and their detox systems do not correctly remove Lyme or mold toxins. So 75% of us do not have that problem, and our immune systems will clean out Lyme and mold toxins by changing them from a fat-based form in the, in, in the liver. The liver will change them from a fat-based form to a water-based form. Then they get moved out into the intestines, and we poop them out. Okay, but it, there are 25% of people, according to the work of a physician named uh, Richie Shoemaker, Dr. Richie Shoemaker, his science shows that about 25, maybe 30% of people have uh, programming issues where their immune systems do not correctly recognize Lyme and or mold toxins actually, and they don't tag them correctly. So they don't get tagged correctly. They go to the liver not tagged correctly. The liver sees them as a fat-based toxin because they're not tagged sends them out still as a fat-based toxin. And in the intestines, as a fat-based toxin, they get reabsorbed again back into your bloodstream. So you just kind of keep recirculating these toxins, okay? So those toxins trigger cytokines, and it can make you feel very severely ill. Now, there's ways we can treat those recirculating toxins, but yeah, mold toxin issues can give you the same kind of picture that Lyme does. Or... They can contribute to the overall mess of Lyme disease is another factor that adds to this cytokine mess, the cytokine pool that people have, okay? Now, what do I think about mold? Well, at the beginning of treatment, I'm going to ask somebody, what happens when you go into moldy environments, wet, damp environments? Do you get worse, okay? Or when you first got sick, were you in a building that had black mold and that had water damage, all right? So I'm looking to see, has somebody breathed in drank in, eaten in mold at some time, or mold toxins, I should say, that may be recirculating, causing their problem, all right? So, um, and so when am I gonna look? Well, at the beginning. If I have a significant history suggesting it, I may try to do a mold detox to begin with, okay? Just a mold detox. I might not even get into the Lyme treatment. I may focus just on doing mold detoxification, all right? Um, or the time I'm also going to consider whether somebody might have mold toxin issues is if we're about six to nine months into treatment, somebody's not getting better, I might start thinking, hmm, I wonder if there are one of the problems that may be holding this person back is, is it possible they might have mold toxin issues, okay? It's one of the many things I'll start looking at when somebody isn't getting better by six to nine months, all right? Okay, so that's just kind of a background on it. Now, I just want to say one thing about this whole mold toxin issue. I want to talk about a patient of mine, and you can find her information all over the internet, okay? So I'm going to use her name. It is okay for me to use her name because she's given me permission to do so, and it's okay that I talk about her story, all right? So her name is Krista Vanderham. Um, you is C-H-R-I-S-T-A. Second word is Vanderham, V-A-N-D-E-R. H-A-M. Her husband's name is Justin and Krista. Um, she's one of the sickest people I've ever managed that has Lyme disease. Um, she saw me a number of number of years ago before I really had much expertise in mold toxin issues and came to see me um, after having a solid history of a tick bite, getting sick afterwards, having a Western blot uh, test, had the full picture that looked like Lyme disease. There was no doubt in my mind. She had everything that suggested Lyme based on symptoms, based on that tick bite, based on her Western blood studies, okay? Solid evidence. And she had um, daily seizures. She would even be to the point of stopping breathing, severe headaches, body pain so bad, even narcotics wouldn't touch it. She was sick, zero out of 10 energy. We put her on IV antibiotics, and I spent time over about two years working with IV antibiotics and also working with all kinds of ways that I work to try to move a treatment forward. And we got her maybe 10 to 15% better. That was it. And she hadn't been able to see me in person for a while because she was so sick. She um, lived away from here. And I told her family that either they were going to have to bring her here by medevac so I could examine her because I was missing that key piece of information um, or they that I would come to see her if they would help support me so I could come see her for that day. They chose um, the, that, that route to actually have me come see her. So before I went up to see her, though, because it was going to be three weeks before I could go, 
I had I just learned about using this product called cholesteramine to bind up Lyme toxins, mold toxins in the intestines and pull them out. So I had her start taking it. Okay, now when I got up there, she greeted me at the door, smiling big. She looked alive, right? And what had happened is using this, this medicine for about three weeks, her energy had climbed up to about seven out of 10. The seizures were gone. Her headaches were markedly improved, and I think maybe about three out of 10. Basically, cholesteramine brought her back to life, okay? And so since that time, I'm very careful about looking for Lyme and mold toxin issues in people at the beginning of treatment, all right? And in looking back at her history, what she was able to figure out is at the same time she got her tick bite, she was living in a building that had black mold growing up on the walls. And what I think in retrospect happened with her is that she um, um, probably was already swimming in mold toxins that she couldn't remove. And then when she got the Lyme infection, it put her over the edge because the Lyme releases similar toxins. And maybe in retrospect, if I hadn't done anything about her Lyme germ, maybe if all we had been able to do was detox those toxins, if I had been knowledgeable about that issue at that time, that might have been enough to have gotten her well. Maybe, I don't know. What I can tell you now, she has her life back 100%. She's had her second baby. Um, she's thrilled to be living life fully. I hear from her on a regular basis. Um, she, um, um, she does periodically have to use cholesteramine at times when she starts feeling a little bit um, the symptoms of quote unquote Lyme or cytokine excess. She'll take her cholesteramine maybe for a day or two and then she does fine for a long time, okay? so. I say that because I learn from things, all right? I was not aware of mold toxicity issues. It was not a big thing on most of our radar screens when I first started working with her. But I gotta tell you the dramatic impact that it can have. And it's now something I screen everyone, at least by asking them questions at the beginning of treatment. You can find, if you Google her, you'll find an hour and a half or so, maybe an hour video that her husband made about her story. It's very painful to watch, but at the end you'll see this, uh, just how great it got for her and um, um, and just the beautiful spirit and being that she is having come through all this as well too. So anyhow, I share that with you just as I know it's a little long-winded, but take a look at her story. You'll see the impact that mold can have, okay? Now I'm gonna do a quick screen share here because I wanna show you something related to what I just said. All right, so back here, okay. So back here um, in the treat line book, well, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you our Lyme disease treatment guidelines, okay? So this is our Lyme disease treatment guidelines. You saw me click on the tab over here. Call it the successful treatment recipe, okay? And you want to make sure of part of your Lyme treatment that you are taking all of these steps, okay? Treating Lyme, everyone, is not just about killing your germs. You've got to right the ship. You've got to correct the abnormalities created by all those cytokines, okay? So one of those things is to get sleep. You want to get six to seven hours of sleep. Here's some recommendations about how to do that. You might even see that L-theanine I talked about earlier for nerve pain right there, okay? Second thing you want to do is lower the cytokines. Again, I like using curcumin to do that. Talked about that there. Third thing you want to do is help your body deal with stress by working with an herb called ashwagandha. Fourth thing you want to do is correct any low adrenals or low thyroid. And you can make those decisions actually based on clinical. You don't even need to have blood testing to really look at these. If you're wondering about how to do that, look in the rationale section down here. On the symptom section about adrenal insufficiency, low thyroid symptoms, see if you have a number of those. If you do, you probably need to correct your adrenals and your thyroid, okay? Um, excuse me here just a minute. The reason that you want to correct your hormones is you need them to work effectively to help your immune system work well. Also recommend that people be on a good multivitamin. <coughs> the two that I like, one is a product called the Energy Infusion uh, by Integrative Therapeutics. You do one scoop a day of that, or you want to do uh, a product by Thorne called MediClear if you tend to be medicine or herb sensitive, and would do one scoop a day of that as well. Okay. Number six, get out another source of cytokines as having too many yeast in your intestines. 
If you wonder if that is a problem for you, come all the way down here and you can go ahead and use our yeast screening questionnaire, okay? If you score over 140 on the screening questionnaire, there's a great chance that yeast is part of your problem. They're increasing cytokines. Those excess cytokines suppress your immune system. So get your yeast out, okay? Number seven, treat your Lyme infection. We talk about how to do that here. Number eight, do some basic detox steps. We talk about that here. <coughs> Excuse me, everyone. I actually swallowed something a little bit strange here. Just a minute. Number nine, be sure to deal with your co-infections, okay? Number 10, um, number 11, exercise. And here's what I wanted to show you. Number 11. What to do at six months and beyond if you are not getting any better, okay? And so you're going to see. These are all the things I start looking at. Number one, make sure that you don't have a type of detox um, problem called an MTHFR defect. See if you have low lime or mold toxin issues. Consider if you have heavy metal toxicity issues, okay? Also, be sure that you've done something about biofilms at this point. Biofilms are slime layers that can cover lime germs and block out treatment, all right? Start considering if you might have too many viruses living in you that are adding to the total uh, health problem that you have, all right? Um, look at solutions to fixing the energy factories in your cells called mitochondria. Um, you might look to make sure that you really did take care of your co-infections of Bartonella and Babesia. It is also possible people don't get better because they've got an autoimmune problem, an arthritis kind of problem, triggered by having Lyme in you, okay? And then finally, always make sure that you've dealt with yeast because um, they can pop up periodically in your treatment and they can make it look like your Lyme treatment isn't going anywhere, okay? Now, notice these are a lot of things that you can deal with. And I know many of practitioners will look at dealing with all of this stuff. At the same time, they're starting to treat the Lyme infection. I really advocate doing your Lyme treatment in steps. And what I believe is taking all of those essential steps that are in uh, my successful treatment recipe, doing those initially, because those are the key steps. Often, if you fix those things, you don't need to fix all of those other abnormalities, okay? So Lyme disease, everyone, is what is known as a total load phenomenon illness. And there are a number of things, like I just outlined, that can add up to make you feel ill. We don't need to correct all of them to make you feel better. We just need to remove enough of those problems to get your ship running correctly, okay? And those things that I outlined in the successful treatment recipe is the key things to do before six to nine months are usually the steps that are going to work for most people to get them well. You don't need to go ahead and remove your mercury fillings, for instance, okay? As I know some practitioners advocate doing it at the beginning. I just look at that as something to do later on. There's more that you're going to get out of the basic steps that I outlined in the successful treatment recipe, okay? All right. So anyhow, I know that may be a little rather long-winded, but I um, wanted to go ahead and answer that for you. All right. Thanks, Debbie, for that question. All right. Let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Nina, for that question, I should say. Uh, I think, Debbie, I think you had a, a part of a question that I accidentally got rid of here, so I am, I am sorry for that. All right. Let's see. Let me go ahead. I'm going to have to get rid of the, the thank you part from you, and I apologize. I think I accidentally got rid of your main question. Okay. Hello, Marianne. Looks like you've got a question here. So let me take a look at this. Um, hold on, everybody. I'm just going to adjust my computer here. There we go. All right. So, um, Marianne, let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Having so much trouble with. Um, hmm. right, let me try that again. Hi, Dr. Ross. Having so much trouble with fatigue. I've tried everything in the book. Ashwagandha gives me insomnia even at one quarter of a cap. Increasing the thyroid med has helped a little. Took the ATP fuel for two months. No noticeable difference. What else can I do? All right. So uh, everyone, Marianne talks about something called ATP fuel. I want to talk about that quickly. 
So energy, what drives our energy has multiple components, okay? The energy factories in our cell are called mitochondria. Now you just heard me in that, my response to my last question, talk about something called mitochondria dysfunction. So every one of our cells has an energy factory system in it called mitochondria. Inside mitochondria are where fat and sugar are burned through a bunch of chemical reactions into a type of cell fuel called ATP. That's why it's called ATP fuel here, okay? Now, when you have chronic infections, what can happen is there's an overproduction in our body of oxidizing agents. Oxidizing agents damage membranes, okay? They damage fat membranes. So they can damage our cell membranes, and they can damage the membranes of our 300 to 400 mitochondria in each cell. If the mitochondria covering gets damaged, you don't get adequate sugar and fat uptake into the mitochondria, so you don't have the fuel source to be burned into cell fuel. Secondly, a lot of the chemical reactions um, that create the ATP cell fuel um, require electrons to be given to them from the healthy fat membrane of the mitochondria, right? So if it's damaged, you don't have adequate energy generation. So ATP fuel has in it something called NT factor, which is the fats that make up that uh, the membrane of the mitochondria. In addition, it has a number of micronutrients that help um, uh, the mitochondria to work better too. Now, I don't use the ATP fuel. I use something that's a little bit more limited in what it has because I think it works just as well and maybe in a little bit, I think it'll reduce costs, called NT factor energy but either way, you want to do two pills of either of these three times a day for two months. And then after that period of time, you want to decrease to one pill three times a day for um, four months. All right. Now, the NT factor has been looked at. And there's a study that shows in people that report fatigue, after using the NT factor for at least two months, there's average energy improvements of 40%. Okay. Now, in the study, people reporting fatigue did not identify if they had Lyme, chronic fatigue fatigue syndrome, if they were just overworked, we have no idea why they reported fatigue. But in the study, average energy improvements of 40% by two months, all right? Based on that study, I did try it with my patients, and I see, in my Lyme patients, actually, that I see average energy improvements of about 40%, okay? So, Mary Ann, it doesn't work in everyone, unfortunately. And at this point, usually I find if it's not helping, if the ATP fuel is not helping by um, two months, I'm going to stop it. I think you've done everything you can, okay? So then I go back to the successful treatment recipe that I just showed you. Make sure you're doing the essential parts of that, okay? So make sure if you still have ongoing fatigue, number one, you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And if you're not doing that naturally, take herbs or drugs to do that, okay? Number two, make sure you're lowering your cytokines with the Mareva 500 because that the increased cytokines give you fatigue, okay? Number three, make sure you're working with ashwagandha as an adaptogen um, or something as an adaptogen. I see the ashwagandha gave you insomnia. So what you might want to do in a, uh, instead of ashwagandha here, Marianne, would be to try another adaptogen. And what I probably recommend is something called rhodiola. That's R-H-O-D-I-O-L-A. Usually anywhere from 100 to 250 milligrams in the morning and between one and two in the afternoon. Helps adrenal function, also is a good adaptogen, helps the body deal with stress, okay? So rhodiola would be an option for you to add here. You also wanna make sure your hormones are adjusted. And I talked about that, that's part of the successful treatment recipe. Mary Ann, if your energy is low, be sure to reevaluate if you might have too many yeast. So that could look like having increased sugar cravings, that might look at having a lot of increased intestinal gas and or bloating. Sometimes if you get suddenly get any acne, you didn't have it before, yeast can trigger that as well too. Okay, so consider if you might have too many yeast, make sure you got your co-infections taken care of. And if you think you did, still go back, look at the symptoms, look at the articles I have about how to diagnose Bambesia and Bartonella, they can get reactive again, okay? And finally, if you take care of all that stuff, all the key steps that we say in the successful treatment recipe, and your energy is stuck, I might look at checking to see if you have heavy metal toxicity, okay? Now, why would that matter? Well, heavy metals like lead and mercury that we get exposed to build up, and once they get inside of our cells, they stay there, they have a half-life, the amount of time it takes for a half to get out, 
of 23 years to 24 years, okay? So you can have a bunch of small exposures over a lifetime that can add up inside of your cells to a problem. Now, a blood test is not going to work to detect that. The way you're going to find out if you have too many heavy metals is to take a chelation medicine called DMSA. Uh, it's a metal magnet, if you will. It'll help pull those uh, heavy metals out of your cells, and then you pee for six hours, and then it's sent off to a, a lab called Doctor's Data that can look at your urine and say whether you have normal amounts of heavy metals coming out or not, okay? Now, the reason you want to focus at looking inside of the cells is what happens with heavy metals is you have too much lead or if you have too much mercury or other heavy metals, they get inside of your mitochondria. There's that word, mitochondria again. They get inside of your mitochondria and they bind to a bunch of enzymes, sulfur on enzymes that are used by the mitochondria to create energy. All right, so enzymes catalyze, make various chemical reactions happen. And if those enzymes are bound up all by these heavy metals, well, they're not going to work correctly. You're going to have energy stuff, okay? So, Marianne, if you followed all the steps of the successful treatment recipe I just outlined, then the next step that I would consider doing for you is to do heavy metal toxin testing, okay? That's where I would probably target my efforts next, all right? So if you want to see more about that, let's just do a quick screen share here again. All right, let's see, that didn't work. Let me go back here. Okay, so back to the treat line book again. So let me just look at, so we have this whole article on heavy metals. Okay, so within the detox chapter, actually I'll show you how I got here. Within the detoxification chapter, all right, so here's the articles we have on detoxification, okay. And the big one that you want to focus on is this one called Heavy Metals, The Problem, um, and um, The Best Test, okay? All right. Take a look here. HG is mercury. PB is lead. There is a video that I created that gives you much more explanation than what I just talked about here, okay? All right. And that should help give you some insights then, okay? All right. So let me go back here again. Okay, Marianne, good luck to you. Thank you for that question. Oh, one more screen share I'm going to do there just a minute here. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so we're back here in the treat line book again. So all of you that are wondering what to do about energy, take a look at the chapter called Energy and Fatigue, okay? And basically it says... Um, do the basic steps. Take a look at this. This is basically follow the successful treatment recipe, okay? Fix your mitochondria. That's what Marianne already was doing with the NT factor. And then we talk here also about possibly doing heavy metals, okay? Now, in terms of my favorite things for low energy, uh, my favorite recommendations are NT factor. I just told you about that. That's the thing you use to fix your mitochondria. And ashwagandha, okay? Those are my favorite two. Take a look at this article. You'll see more why I'm saying that, all right? Okay, so let me go back here again. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Hello, Randy. Let's see. I started dealing with yeast, as you recommended. Doctor put me on fluconazole, 100 milligrams a day for a month. I'm also taking banderol and cemento. I think that's what you mean by BNS. Uh, 15 drops two times a day. I got Berber for detoxing. Are all of those okay to take together? And do you think it's okay and will kill yeast? Is it okay to eat fruit or let go of all sugar? Okay, so, Randy, in terms of treating yeast, um, it is okay. I find most of the time I can still, as long as I'm treating for yeast with diplopan, and I'm having a person double their probiotics, so... Um, being on at least 10, even up to 50 billion cultures a day of your probiotics. If I do that, and I have them on a diflucan, it's okay to go ahead and continue the antibiotics, herbal or prescription. Your banderol cemento is herbal antibiotics, okay? It's okay to remain on those, and I find that people do quite well getting well still, okay? 
And is it okay to do berber with that? Absolutely, I find no problem with that. In terms of sugar, I would limit your cookie, candy, cake, ice cream, the obviously oversweetened things, okay? I like to limit fruit juices and vegetable juices, okay? Because um, although I think fruit and vegetables are fine, they are sources of sugar, the sugar in fruit, the sugar in vegetables is bound up by fiber, which decreases its availability in the intestines and the stomach to yeast, okay? But when you juice, you strip out all that fiber, and then suddenly those sugars are available to your yeast, and that can cause the yeast to get more active, all right? So that's generally what I recommend. Any, any carbs that you have that have a lot of fiber, so your beans, legumes generally are still okay to take when you have yeast. Um, your grains, as long as they have fiber, white rice does not have fiber, brown rice does. Your grains are okay, and your fruit and vegetables are generally okay. Now, if I got somebody, I cannot get their yeast under control. I may become really strict even about pulling out the carbs that have fiber, but on an initial round, you're doing fine. And the other thing, Randy, it would have been better if your physician had used 200 milligrams one time a day on your diflucan, but you'll probably still be okay on that 100 milligrams one time a day. Okay, so everyone, if you're looking for recommendations about how to treat yeast, if you have them, I'll do a real quick screen share here so you know where to look later. Okay, so we're back in the treat line book. I'm going to go back here and we're going to look at the whole chapter we have on yeast. Okay, so you see how big of a problem this is? We devote a whole chapter to the problem of yeast in the intestines. Okay. So to figure out if you might have too many yeast in the middle or at the beginning of your treatment, take a look at this article, Assignment Problem, Do You Have Yeast? To figure out what you do to get rid of yeast, I give you both herbal and prescription options. Take a look at this article called Kills Yeast, A Brief Guide, okay? So anyhow, take a look at these articles here. You'll see the various ways that we say that you can go at this, uh, but can be a very perplexing problem for some people, all right? Let me go ahead and go back here again. All right. Thank you, Randy. Good luck to you. Good seeing you here again, too, by the way. Good luck with that yeast treatment. All right. Let's see here. All right. So this is a question for Sarah. And for some reason, Sarah, your question um, is not... It's showing up in a way that I can't repost it under your name. Bear with me in a minute. I'm just going to go ahead and post it um, in my name, and then I'll show it up on the screen so everyone can see it. So hold on here a minute. Okay, everyone, this is Sarah's question, even though it's showing up under my name. Um, hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks for these very helpful webinars. You're welcome. Um, I enjoy doing them, actually. I have a good time with these. I like helping people, so this is a great way to do it separate from seeing people here in my office and separate from putting all those resources that I've written on the internet for you all as well too. Um, let's see, can Lyme disease cause an elevation in CPK levels and general inflammation and pain when walking? Okay, so CPK everyone is a um, chemical that comes in from the inside of muscles and can, um, uh, can become elevated when muscles are inflamed or even start to break down. All right. Generally, it's not elevated in most people with Lyme, but occasionally I will see a person, uh, Sarah, that does have elevated CPK levels. Okay, so it could come from Lyme. It is not a common finding, though. I would I would let you know that. Okay. Um, it in addition, yes, Lyme does give you general inflammation. That's the whole conversation I had earlier tonight about Lyme trigger cytokines that give you inflammation, and that can give you pain on walking as well too. All right. So yeah, I can do it, but you ought to work with your physician to figure out if other causes of CPK elevation, you need to make sure there aren't other um, causes that can be eliminated. One of those would be to review your medications to see if they aren't ones that could be triggering uh, that elevated CPK as well too. All right? All right? Good luck to you, Sarah. Thank you for that question. All right, let's see here. Okay, hi, Jim. Let's see. 
EBV, um, nuclear antigen, antibody, IgG is 4.8, and the EBV viral capsid, um, IgG is 2.7. Five, herpes virus, six, IgG is one to 40. Should I be concerned about these results? My doctor prescribed Valtrex to treat this. I was told as long as the viruses show up on blood work, we have to treat. Is that true? Um, no, it's not true. <laughs> but that's my philosophy. But let me talk more about that, okay? So first of all, when somebody, if we look at, um, trying to figure out where to jump into your question here. All right, let's look at viruses, okay? So there are four viruses that are common in even in healthy people. Those four viruses are the Epstein-Barr virus, which you're reporting here. We also call that the monovirus, okay? There is another uh, herpes virus called human herpes virus type 6, which is a respiratory virus. No, it is not sexually transmitted, okay? It's a respiratory virus. There's another one called parvovirus B19, and a fourth one called cytomegalovirus, all right? These are viruses that are common in healthy people and occur probably in about 10% of the population, all right? So 10% of people may have one or more of these viruses that are healthy. Now, if we look at people that have fatiguing illnesses, they seem to occur in a greater degree. So maybe 20, 30% of fatiguing illnesses will have evidence of these viruses. There has been a research, there has been, there is a theory that um, if your immune system is making increased levels of antibodies called IgG antibodies, that's what you have here, and if those IgG antibodies are markedly elevated against the viruses, that those viruses may no longer be kept in check by the immune system, kept under control, kept at a level they don't hurt you, but rather that the immune system now is trying to get active because the virus has become a problem, okay? So IgG antibodies, like you have here, once you make them against a virus, they will always remain in you. And they don't prove by themselves that the germ is active. So there's this theory that says, well, maybe if they're really elevated, that means that the germ is active, okay? So I do not call an elevation of 1 to 40 being really elevated. And the way that that test is done, 1 to 320 is elevated. So 40 is not elevated, 320 wouldn't be a big elevation. So I don't consider your HHV6, your herpes human virus type 6, to be elevated here. You do have some very small elevations in your monovirus, but I would not even call those big elevations. I usually, in the scale that the monovirus is being done, would consider elevations at about eight or higher to be significant, okay? So first of all, just on the surface, this is not a level that I would call markedly elevated, all right? All right, secondly, even if these were elevated, this is not where I would put my attention at the beginning or even for the first nine months of a treatment. Because if you do all those other steps that I outlined in the successful treatment recipe, the basic steps you should do in your treatment, which is sleep, get cytokines down, get yeast out, work with an adaptogen, correct your hormones, and treat Lyme and the co-infections. If you do all those steps, generally over a six to nine month period of time, your immune system will turn on well enough to put those viruses back under control if they are a problem, okay? So I just want you to know that, all right? Now I will tell you, there is there has only been one study done that looks at this idea that says, if you have marked elevation of antibodies against viruses, that treating them makes a difference. And that is a study that looked at people that had marked elevations of the EBV and the HHV6, and in that study, they had to have elevations of 320 or more, okay? Um, and it said they had to have elevations of both of those. And in that study, everyone was put on an antiviral medicine called Valcite, not Valtrex, like your doctor's wanting to do here, but Valcite. And they were followed over a six-month period of time. In that study, 50% of people reported improvements of 30% or more. And their antibodies came down. Okay, so that study would suggest that, yeah, treating for people that have elevated antibodies that have chronic fatigue can make a difference, okay? But that's only one study. I don't think you have marked elevations here. And then again, 
it wouldn't be where I'd put my efforts. I would do other things first, especially if you're in the first six to nine months of your treatment. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Jim. Thank you for that question. All right. Let's see here. All right. So I'm going to post a question by Pedro that unfortunately is not showing up the way it's supposed to again. So I got posted under my name. Just bear with me here for a minute. Okay, this is from Pedro, everyone. Even though it's showing up under my name, I did not write the question. I'm not the messenger. I'm just the person providing the answer here, okay? Um, what is your opinion regarding new line treatment called low-dose immunotherapy? Okay, so I'm just going to give you a general comment, okay? In Lyme disease, because this is so difficult to get over, every six months to maybe every 12 months, we have the new IT treatment of the season, okay? So what I mean by an IT treatment is the current popular one that everyone thinks is the way to go. And generally, most of these IT treatments fade out of popularity quickly when we find that they probably don't do what we think they're supposed to do. Um, about a year ago, it was using essential oils, like the doTERRA oils, okay? And, you know, I had a lot of people that went down that pathway. Generally, most did not get much benefit, okay? Um, the other one that's kind of circling around out there is that all of this is a parasite infection problem, of which parasites may be part of the problem, but I don't think they're the big thing, okay? That's another it treatment that's starting to, to loop around out there. And this low-dose immunotherapy is the new it treatment of the season. And I really hold a negative opinion of it, all right? So let's talk why. So what the theory is with low-dose immunotherapy is that um, you can train the immune system to stop reacting against the Lyme germ that is in you, and therefore you can restore health because the symptoms will go away. It's much like we give allergy shots to somebody that is allergic to a certain pollen or to their cats or their dogs, and we give allergy um, shots to those people, which basically is giving them the same thing they're allergic to but at increasing doses until the immune system learns to ignore it, okay? Now, why am I opposed to this? Well, maybe it does get the symptoms better, but boy, what, what are we doing? We need the immune system to help keep this germ under control, okay? This is a germ that basically has already survived by partially wiping out the immune system through immunosuppression, through the way it hides away from the immune system, okay? It's already done a masterful job hiding and evading and suppressing the immune system. Why on earth would we do something else to suppress the immune system so it doesn't react against this germ, okay? I worry that down the road, four, five, 10 years down the road, what we're gonna see is that people that are doing this low-dose immunotherapy are gonna have raging Lyme that nothing can help with, okay? So what I want you to know in Lyme is there are no magic bullets. There is not the thing that's going to save the day for anyone here, unfortunately. We haven't found it. It requires doing the trench work, getting in the trenches, following the successful treatment recipe, and fixing all those other abnormalities in six to nine months that I talk about. But unfortunately, I do not think the, the money is to be found in low-dose immunotherapy, and I'm very afraid that we may be harming people down the road by doing that now extremely afraid actually okay so i'm strongly against it all right thanks for that question pedro all right that may be a video clip i'll create for a new article tomorrow <laughs> come to think of it i've been thinking about writing one about that but i think that summarizes it well enough all right let's see here hello debbie Let's see, where are we time-wise? Wow, the evening's flying by here. Um, hi, Dr. Ross. I'm being treated for Lyme a disease. I recently had a DEXA done for bone density. My left hip showed osteoporosis. I didn't take calcium supplements, and my MD doesn't want me eating much dairy. What do you suggest? I have recently begun walking more as my left foot neuropathy is slightly better, I believe, is what you've written here. Um, hold on, Debbie. I just want to make sure I don't have a second part to your question hanging up here somewhere. No, nope, don't see that second part of your question hanging up here. 
All right, so let me try to answer this. So um, okay, so the question I have, so the quick the two things that are essential to correct thinning of your bones, osteoporosis or osteopenia, is thinning osteoporosis means marked thinning, okay, is getting calcium into the bones and using vitamin D to support getting calcium in the bones, all right? So I'm at a loss as to why your physician is saying no calcium. Um, I can understand that calcium may get in the way of taking some medicines like your doxycycline, tetracyclines, for instance. But, you know, in general, what you ought to be doing is working with antibiotics that are not hurt by being on calcium. And you can schedule the time of day that you take your calcium so that it's not getting in the way um, of uh, your antibiotics. Okay, so number one, I totally disagree. Get on calcium. Um, you need to, to rebuild your bones. You also ought to be on vitamin D, probably around 5,000 international units a day, okay? And the other thing that you could look at is taking an herb called Ipraflavone. That's I-P-R-A-F-L-A-V-O-N-E, Ipraflavone. Um, oh, gosh, I am going to blank on how to dose this right now. This is an herb I used to use more in the days when I was doing family medicine, integrative medicine, and alternative medicine as primary care. Gosh, I think it's I think it is dosed as 80 milligrams twice a day, I believe. But here's what I would do. I, I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, so Google Ipraflavone and the name Tori Hudson. That's T-O-R-I, last name Hudson, H-U-D-S-O-N, uh, N-D. She's a naturopathic doctor. Um, she's a well-known authority on women's health care, using natural medicines, and find what her recommendations are on the Ipraflavone, okay? Ipraflavone basically uh, prevents the bone from breaking down itself, which is a way of holding calcium in the bone, okay? And that's how it works, okay? So you need to put more calcium in to build the bones. You need vitamin D to help support that. And then you need to prevent bone breakdown which is what uh, the infraflavone will do, okay? And see what Tori Hudson recommends for her recommendations. I'm just not remembering off the top of my head at this point, all right? All right, good luck to you, Debbie. All right, so I'm being asked by, De by Megan, can you repeat the name of the woman you mentioned who has a video online that her husband made about her story with mold and line? Yes. It's Krista, C-H-R-I-S-T-A, last name Vanderham, B-A-N-D-E-R-H-A-M. And you can find them, I believe their website is even Justin and Krista Vanderham.com. Anyhow, you'll, you'll find, just Google her name, you'll find her website. Um, or, or Google Krista Vanderham Canada, and you'll find her name, you'll find her website, okay? All right, good luck to you. Oh, I should mention one thing too. Krista is glad to help people. She's glad to talk with you, okay? Now, <laughs> I hope that not everyone floods her here all of a sudden, but she's a big advocate for people with Lyme and a big advocate for people with mold toxicity issues, okay? So she's out there still fighting the fight for those uh, people that need help at this point as well too, all right? All right, let's see. Come back down here. All right, let's see what we got here. Hello, Francine. Please show us your pups. <laughs> All right, I will in a minute here. Let me read the rest of your question first. I have had Lyme, Babesia, and as you have pointed out to me last month, I likely have Bartonella for 23 years. I am reluctant to use antibiotics. Is it possible to treat long-term I think you mean LB, Lyme, uh, let me just make sure what I understand by it. I think you mean Lyme Borreliosis. I believe that's what you mean by LB. And B, with minimal or zero antibiotics. What do you think, let's see, what do you think Chinese herbs with or without antibiotics? Also, I have read about a specific hash to treat Lyme. 
is it possible after so many years, any opinion about using marijuana as part of a treatment? Okay, so most important things here first, okay? You ask for it, come here. You come here. Yeah, get out over here. Do you want to come here too, hey? No? Okay, everyone, this is Thor. You probably have seen him hopping around in the background. This is my boy. This is my boy, the Sinji, okay? And then I have to show you the other one. Okay, and this this is Halo, who is not as camera friendly as what Thor is. Okay, and I had to wake her up. She's not even paying attention here tonight. So these are my Basenjis. Um, they actually come with me to work each day. Um, they um, I actually put them inside their kennel when I actually have a person back in the office. But a lot of the day they do get to roam into the free areas of the clinic, and some of my patients actually like having them present. So they're part of the healing here at. Uh, uh, the clinic, my clinic, the Healing Arts Partnership. <laughs> so anyhow, that's Thor and Halo. Um, anyhow, okay, back to the serious part of your question. Let's talk about medicinal marijuana first, okay? So medicinal marijuana, everyone, everyone um, uh, basically there's two ways to get it. There's something called CBD oil, or you can get the bud of the, the street drug kind of stuff. That's your bud of the plant. That's a flowering part of the plant. It's rich in a chemical called THC with a little bit of a chemical called CBD. THC is what gives you the high. Sometimes it might do a better job of pain control, okay? CBD comes from the green part of the plants. And it is, um, is very useful medicinally. Um, it is helpful. Now, there is not such a thing as pure CBD. You're always going to get a little THC in your CBD, okay? But the THC is what gives you the high. CBD is great at helping with pain, insomnia, nausea, muscle aches, a lot of the symptoms that people get with Lyme disease, CBD can help with. THC can too, but you're going to get the high of it, okay? Now, one downside to both THC and CBD, they both can limit your thinking, okay? So they're not going to be the best in terms of getting any improvements in your cognition, all right? Now, there is some limited science. I know Dr. Ernie Murakami, many of you may be aware of him. He's from Canada, many of my Canadian patients. And those of you listening on the webinar tonight that are Canadian, are aware of Ernie Murakami. He um, is a Lyme pioneer up in British Columbia that actually had his license pulled by the uh, medical authorities because he was treating Lyme disease. So, but he still is out there um, leading the fight on this one as well too. And he is, he's advocating these days, he thinks that medicinal marijuana can actually kill Lyme. I'm not as solid on that, okay? I think it may, but I don't think it would be the, the, the magic bullet that we've been looking for here, but clearly it can help with a lot of symptoms. I happen to be in a state, Washington State, where we can do medicinal marijuana, so I can even recommend to people to get CBD oil or to get THC-rich uh, um, substances as well, too, okay? So that's my opinion. It can help with symptoms. I don't think it's really going to give you much benefit at actually killing the germ, okay? All right, in terms of Lyme and Bartonella, can you treat them without using antibiotics? The answer is yes. You could use herbal antimicrobials, all right? So for Lyme, I use, like using two products. One is called Banderol. The other one is Cemento. Banderol is an extract from something called the Atoba tree. Cemento is cat's claw. When we use the two of those together, I find success rates in about 85 to 90% of the time I can help a person get better, okay? If you want to read more about those two herbs and how I recommend using them, you can find an article on the Treat Lyme site called Otoba Bark Extract and Cat's Claw, all right? Um, or you can do the search box on the site. You can find the article there. Basically, you work slowly up to 30 drops of each two times a day. And again, I think they have equal chances of working as any oral prescription antibiotic combination, okay? All right. In terms of herbs for uh, Bartonella, well, you know, that's changing. In fact, I was um, have been thinking uh, earlier this week that I need to go back in and rewrite my How to Treat Bartonella article based on some new experience I've been having with a two-herb combination that I've been working with here lately in my practice. So as many of you know, by following these webinars for a while, I'm constantly trying things. I'm seeing what works, and I throw out stuff that I thought worked. If it doesn't work anymore, and I try something new. All right, so generally, when it comes to treating Bartonella, Prescription antibiotics, I usually think two work best for Bartonella, and that it, they'll only, they will work, though, 80 to 85% of the time. And traditionally, the herb Hutunia and another herb compound called Abart are the main ones that people have used traditionally for Bartonella. 
I've only found those substances to work maybe about 40 or 50 percent of the time. Lately, though, I've been going back and re-looking at the recommendations of an herbalist called Buehner, um, B-U-E-H-N-E-R. Many of you are familiar with him. And um, I've been looking at a couple of, some of his recommendations around Bartonella. And, you know, essentially what he recommends for Bartonella is to do things to boost the immune system. Now, he's got herbal ways of doing it. My way of doing it is follow all the steps of the successful treatment recipe, which is sleep, using a good adaptogen like the ashwagandha I've talked about, get your cytokines down with curcumin, get your yeast out. Those are the steps you need to do to boost your immune system. He's got some other recommendations, okay? And in addition, kill your germs, okay? So he recommends for germ killing using hutunia coupled with another herb called Siddha Akuta. And that's S-I-D-A, second word is A-C-U-T-A, -A, all right? So I've been working with that, and I'm, I'm finding they work maybe about 65, 70% of the time. Um, so I'm getting some success. I still don't think it is equivalent to doing um, your oral antibiotics, but it's a way to go. Um, if you're to do the Siddha Akuda, you get it from a company called Woodland Essence. Um, they have a site. You'll have to find them on the Internet. They'll sell directly to you. You want to start at one quarter scoop. I'm sorry, one quarter teaspoon, that is, um, three times a day. And probably over two weeks, I would increase that to about one half teaspoon three times a day. And I would couple that with uh, Hutunia. Um, and Hutunia is a product by um, Nutramedics. And I would work up to 30 drops twice a day on that, okay? And um, it's about time I go back in and correct that article. I also have to go in and correct my Babesia article. And as you know, with the treat line book, I, I did say that we would keep it up to date. So uh, it's, it's my goal probably this weekend is to spend some time going back and correcting a couple of articles of which I'll be updating the Bartonella one and the Babesia one will probably be the most, uh, the two that uh, I'll be updating here pretty soon uh, based upon that, okay? Um, so those are some ideas for you to consider there as well too, all right? And I hope, I think I got your parts of your question answered there, Francine. Um, the other thing to consider that's not antimicrobial, uh, that some of my patients have success with, although I cannot recommend because I'm a medical doctor and the Food and Drug Administration here in the States, has been known to take licenses away, so I'm not going to recommend it. But what I will tell you is some of my patients have success on their own doing something called a rife machine, okay? And the theory with rife machines is that rifes um, generate electromagnetic frequencies that uh, resonate with the covering of a germ such that that germ covering vibrates and eventually it breaks apart and bursts, all right? Um, the reason the FDA doesn't approve such things and says I can't recommend them is there's no safety studies long term. So I'm not recommending it. I'm just telling you some people have success with it, okay? And that success from what I can see based on what they tell me is around maybe 60 to 65% of the time it may help in situations like this as well. Too. All right, there you go. Good luck to you, Francine, and thank you for your question. All right, let's see here. All right, I think, where are we time-wise here, everyone? Now let's take, I'm gonna probably take one more here if I can get this to work correctly. All right, hello, Natasha, let's see. Hello, I have Lyme and Babesia, perhaps other co-infections too. For about a year, I've been experiencing intense pressure, vibration, and bubble-like sensations in my head, ears, sinuses, nose, and recently on my tongue and urine too. Any thoughts? I'm on an herbal treatment for three months. Thank you. So when I think of vibrations, I think of neurologic irritation. And one of the things I think of is could you have a Bartonella infection, okay? Now, that alone does not tell me Bartonella, but it makes me wonder it. Head pressure, too. Babesia, on the other hand, usually would give you a lot of headaches up here, but not necessarily head pressure. Head pressure makes me think of Bartonella sometimes. Sometimes Lyme will give that to you. Sometimes Lyme can give you vibrations. But go back and look to make sure you don't have symptoms of Bartonella, okay? And so we have a whole article about how do you diagnose Bartonella. Actually, the article is about Bartonella symptoms. I'll show you that here in a minute. But Bartonella symptoms, the big ones are, do you have pain on the soles of your feet? And you want to have a number of these. You don't have to have all of them. 
But do you have pain on the soles of your feet? Do you have significant cognitive improvement, thinking uh, impairment, I should say? Um, uh, often people with Barton will have a lot of anxiety. That seems to be more than you might expect in the situation. Uh, people with Bartonella um, uh, may go to the restroom or uh, have urination problems with either burning on urination or urinary frequency. They may tend to sweat more in the daytime. Um, they may have restless legs, so they've got to kick their reg legs around a lot at nighttime. Um, they can have depression. They can have psychiatric problems. And they tend to have a lot of neurologic sensitivities, like vibration that you're describing, and also sound sensitivities, light sensitivities, maybe even touch sensitivities, okay? Now, those are symptoms that I think of with Bartonella. With Bartonella, our testing is really not that good. I mean, we estimate maybe 30 strains. We can only test well for two. So I usually make a decision to treat for Bart based on the symptoms, okay? So anyhow, that's something to consider. Natasha, it's kind of a loaded question. There's more that, could, that I could work with here if I knew more about you. Um, the one thing I will show you, I'm going to do a quick screen share, and this is for everyone that's still hanging in there here. I'm going to do a quick screen share because I want to show you something you might consider um, if, if you need to, all right? So um, one way to get more information from me is to try this online consult here. So this is a one-to-one -one medical consult service that I run, and it's a way to actually have an online visit with me where I can give you my opinion and give you treatment recommendations, okay? Now, because I have not actually seen you in person, when you do this type of service, I'm not able to prescribe for you or um, write an order for testing for you, but I can give you the recommendations to take your physician if we need to do things like that, the other thing, I can also recommend herbs. I mean, I don't need to actually see you in person to do that. The issue is my medical board, uh, which grants me my license to practice, does require that I see a person face-to-face, -face, do a physical exam on them before I can prescribe or order tests. But if you want more input from me than I can give in this type of a forum, or I'm just not getting your questions because we have so many questions answered or asked here tonight, consider a one-to-one -one consult. Um, I, I'm able to help people from across the world um, doing this type of a visit, and I'd be glad to help any one of you that have those uh, kind of issues that I can give some input on as well, too. All right? So, anyhow, Natasha, thank you for that question. Good luck to you. All right, everyone, that is it for me tonight. Um, so, I've, I've enjoyed visiting with every one of you tonight, and I, I love doing these webinars. We have two more scheduled next week and the week after. Um, please be sure to sign up for those. You can do that either in a second by going back to um, our treat Lyme site, and in a minute here, as I close out the webinar, I'm actually going to take you there. You will be taken there as I close the webinar. So you can go to the webinars tab and sign up for next week. Um, the other thing is, if you haven't subscribed to the treat Lyme book, do. Um, it's got a great lot of great resources. It, it has the same kind of information I'm giving you here, but um, has a lot more in it that you can get to without having to wait to have your question heard, okay? Uh, you can use the search bar to figure out what articles we have and what you want, or, or search by the chapters. You can see which chapters we have on any kind of problem. Um, to subscribe, basically, you're going to click on an article, and if you are not subscribed, you will be asked to subscribe, okay? Keep in mind, when you do subscribe, you, tr you um, support the work that we're doing here, including these webinars, okay? It's one of the ways that I support these webinars and the amount of time I put into it, plus the amount of time that it takes for me to run the websites uh, to give you all this useful information as well. Too. So I appreciate your support. And I appreciate if you would take the time to go ahead and sign up for the treat line book as well. And then again, consider uh, whether you might want to do one of the one-to-one -one medical consults as well too. Tomorrow morning, you will get an email from me uh, when the, the video is ready. Uh, it will also include a link for you to sign up for the next webinars as well too. Thanks for joining me tonight, everyone. And uh, have a good night, everyone.